April Fool's Day. You always tend to forget about it until it happens to you. And uh, my daughters are at that age where they're learning about these things and their imagination just is going wild with this concept of April Fool's Day. And so they got me good yesterday. They went all out. The first trick was Lua made me some lemonade. And that lemonade had salt and cayenne pepper and uh, apple juice. It, it felt like a little clean, you know, like a cleanse kind of thing. <laughs> so a little spice in there. And then they put gummy bears in my quesadilla. They, uh, they mashed up sweet potato and they put it on the bottom of my shoe with, with uh, food coloring to make it look like our dog's doo-doo. So... <laughs> And then lastly, went to bed, and there was rainbow sprinkles in the bed sheets. So I guess we'll just vacuum that when we get home. Nowhere is safe. Nowhere is safe. And uh, today, we're going to be looking at Psalm 91, all about safety and security. Psalm 91, safe and secure. I love this psalm, and this one has become near and dear to me in these last few years. Now, one of the times in life when you feel most, most vulnerable or, or most violated is when you have something stolen from you. Maybe you've had that feeling before. You, you thought you were safe, you thought you were secure, and then before you know it, your precious belongings are gone. I, I remember pulling into the, the driveway with my mom and my sister when I was a little boy on a random school day. I was just a little kid. We pulled into our house, and we saw that the front door of the house was hanging wide open. Oh, that's strange. What's going on? So we went inside, And we found out that our house was burglarized. Everything was gone. The stereo was gone. The TV was gone. My Super Nintendo was gone. (sighs) Hard to recover from that. Uh, Actually, God did protect the family. My my parents did music ministry. And the thieves missed the closet that had all of their guitars and other instruments in there. So we saw God's hand there. Later on in life, I turned 16. I got my first car. A black 93 Honda Accord, and I had the trunk of my car broken into right in our own driveway. Uh, This is on the other side of Lakeside now. I guess Lakeside's a dangerous place. But uh, they broke in, they stole my skateboard, my drum cymbals, and my Red Ryder BB gun. All right. Devastating for teenage John. You know, wow. How could this happen? Now, we all want to feel safe. This is why we have dogs, lights, locks. Fences, firearms, ring cameras. You know, these, these all seem necessary in this world in which we live. Filled with ne'er-do-wells and, and porch pirates. People want to steal your stuff. Security is actually a huge industry. Listen to these stats. This is from a, a website called safehome.org. It says, Americans spend more than $20 billion on home security every year. 38% of Americans own a home security product. Just 20% of Americans said property crime isn't a problem at all where they live. So that means 80% do say it is a problem. Uh, 47.13% have been a victim of a property crime. 47.64% were present when property crimes occurred. And then obviously on a national level, we have security issues. Every hour, did you know this, that taxpayers in the U.S. are paying $3.6 million for homeland security costs. That's every hour. The defense budget is currently somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.3 trillion. That's with a T. (laughs) So, uh, amazing, right? Now, Psalm 91 is a psalm all about security. It's a powerful psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. It's a testimony, really, about where true security in life can be found. Uh, Some referred to the psalm as the soldier's psalm. And apparently, soldiers would quote it to each other before heading off to war. It was meant to serve as kind of an encouragement in trying or perilous circumstances. And this was a psalm meant to encourage God's people that God is our security in in life. And and maybe you need a reminder of that this morning. So before we jump in, just a little background. Who is the author of this psalm? We don't know. (laughs) We don't know. The superscript of the psalm, it doesn't say who wrote it. If you look at Psalm 90 in your Bible, that one is labeled, it says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. A lot of times rabbis, if a psalm doesn't have the person who wrote it listed, they just assume it was the person who wrote the previous one. 
So perhaps this is a Psalm of Moses, or perhaps it's a Psalm of David. We're not really sure, but let's jump right in and uh, read this amazing Psalm together. Actually, first, let me pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time that we can spend here and invest in our relationship with you and invest in eternity, God. We pray that your word would minister to our hearts today. May it be clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, verse 1, Psalm 91. It starts this way. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, shelter and shadow are metaphors. Here, These are metaphors for care, for protection, for comfort, a secure hiding place. The Lord is the one who provides all this. But notice who gets to experience these things. It's not for everybody. It's specifically for those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. To dwell means to habitually reside. It's a very specific promise here to a very specific group. It's not for everybody. It's apparently not even for all believers or or people who casually click Christian on their social media profile. You know, it's not for people who casually attend church or they don't really follow the Lord with their life. No, this is for people who dwell with God, who habitually reside with Him. Those believers who live in close fellowship with God, they are the ones who receive these specific benefits for taking their relationship with God seriously, for staying near to the Lord. These are promises for those who walk with the Lord day by day, hour by hour, trusting and obeying. And even before we go further, don't we know this to be true? You you look at your life, and and we know that on those days that we spend time with the Lord, we're we're in his word, we're, we're praying, we're serving doesn't it just seem like you have a better day, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not, not rocket science. It's just like, yes, I dwell with the Lord, and I have a better day, or at least a better outlook on my day. I'm not saying that there's fewer bummers, right? There's still going to be traffic. There's still going to be people who say things or, or do things that, that hurt you, or uh, you might even make foolish mistakes, too. But what I am saying is that there are, without a doubt, certain benefits of regularly spending time in God's presence, of dwelling with the Lord. And this is exactly what Jesus taught in the New Testament. What we read here in Psalm 91 sounds a lot to me like what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Listen to the words of the Lord. He said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine... So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So that that concept of dwelling, abiding, it's the same thing. It's to habitually reside, to remain in God's presence. Now, when you do that, you're going to have less of some things and more of others. And this is what it talks about elsewhere in Scripture. Galatians 5. You're going to have less of the deeds of the flesh. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. When you're dwelling with the Lord, you're going to have less of that, and you're going to have more of the fruit of the Spirit, which are love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So our psalmist today, he begins the psalm by affirming that there's a specific promise for those who remain in God's presence, and that promise is security. Promise is security, and this is our first point today. Our security is found in God. This is where true security is found. And it's really rooted in who God is, his his character and his nature. Notice the uh, amazing titles of God being used here in this psalm. First, he's called the Most High. That's one of my favorite titles that God has. He is higher than any false god, lowercase g god. He's higher than the false gods of any enemy. He's El Elyon. He's also Almighty, the sovereign ruler of the world. His great power to protect 
his people. There's nothing too hard for God. And so this is why we have that security, because this is who our God is. And the titles continue into the next verse. Look at verse 2. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The Lord, notice it's, it's all caps. That's uh, showing to us, giving us a tip that this is the proper name for God, Yahweh. This is his personal name. This is the covenant name he revealed to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3. So the psalmist is saying to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, my God. Notice all of these are personal, right? They all start with this intimate pronoun, my. He's my refuge. In other words, he's a shelter. He's a place of safety. And he's my fortress. It's like a, like a castle, a stronghold, a place where enemies cannot harm you, a place where no evil can get to you. One of my neighbor's Wi-Fi name at my place Maybe you guys live in a neighborhood where you, you pull up and try to connect to the Wi-Fi and you can see what all the crazy people living nearby have as the titles of their Wi-Fi. <laughs> and one of my neighbors, I don't know who it is, their Wi-Fi name is the Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all the geeks in the, the crowd are laughing because they know what that means. <laughs> that is Superman's hideout. I always thought that was an odd name. I didn't understand it until somebody told me that that's what the reference was. And what is that? What is the fortress? It's the place where Superman's secure. The villains can't find him there, right? And so I guess that's how they view their house. Now, the Hebrew word here is matsud. And here's a place in Israel known as masada, masada or matsada. And uh, it's related to this word. It's the word for fortress. It's a pretty unique place in Israel. I've been to Israel, but unfortunately, we didn't make it to this destination Uh, Lord willing, one day in the future I'll get to go there. But it's fascinating because it's an ancient fortification in the southern district of Israel. And it's situated on top of this huge isolated rock plateau. It's located on the the eastern edge of the Judean desert. It overlooks the Dead Sea. Herod the Great, yes, the, the famous baby killer in the Bible, he was the one who built this. He built two palaces for himself, in fact, on the mountain. And then he fortified this place. Uh, around 37 to 31 BC. And what's amazing is that according to Josephus, who's a Jewish historian, the siege of Masada by Roman troops took place from 73 to 74 AD at the end of the first Jewish-Roman war. The Romans uh, were occupying Israel during that time, and there was always these skirmishes. But this was the place where the last holdouts, the last zealots, the last Jewish insurrectionists stayed. The Romans actually took, it took them months to build a siege ramp up to this fortress. And when they got up there, when they finally got up there, all they found were 960 dead bodies. These Jewish rebels preferred to take their own life rather than let the Roman scum come and kill them. So it's a, it stands as kind of like this amazing representation of a strong-willed people and, and a stronghold for people who, who won't back down or, or will not be hurt by the enemy. And what are we seeing in all of this? We're seeing that the most secure place we can possibly be is in a personal trusting relationship of obedience to the Lord. He is our refuge. He's our fortress. And notice he says, my God in whom I trust. He doesn't say a God or the God or our God even. He says, my God. It's personal for him. And it has to be personal for you too. When trouble comes, as it inevitably will, you know, it's not like this vague concept of the man upstairs is going to help you in that time. No, you have to have a personal relationship with God to experience that peace. It's a personal relationship of trust, believing in God, believing that what he wants is always best. He's our heavenly father. Like a good parent, he instructs us in the better way, even if we don't understand it. We can trust him to always do good and not harm in our lives. So ultimately, to dwell with God means to walk with him, to trust the Lord, to trust him enough to obey him with your lifestyle, to trust and obey when he speaks. And and he's spoken to us through the word. And uh, you know what's amazing is we live in a culture that 
attacks and attacks the word of God. It attacks the Bible, everything about it. The culture tries to dismantle it. It's, it says that this is a bad book filled with bad things, bad commands. That's, it's not good for people. It's, it's destructive. That's not for our blessing. It's for our ruin. Uh, listen to the famous atheist Richard Dawkins who wrote a book called The God Delusion. L- listen to what he says. He says, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. It's like, wow, thank you, Richie. Uh, I don't know where you stand. Can you make it a little more clear for me? Yeah. Uh, and what that amounts to is a lot of hot air. Because you read your Bible, and what do you see? You see a God who says things like this, Deuteronomy thirty nineteen, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. That's God. He wants us to choose life, but he dignifies us with the choice. He wants us to choose the way of life. He, he always knows what's best. And he's trying to communicate to us through his word for our good, for his glory. Uh, but it's not good enough for some people. Uh, let me just give you one small example. You know, the Bible says that God made wine to gladden the hearts of men. But it also warns against drunkenness. It, it pretty much plainly says, do not get drunk. Now, is God trying to take away your fun? Is he trying to take away your, your liberty? Maybe he's just trying to preserve your life. <laughs> preserve your liver. Keep your marriage intact. Make your home a safe place for your wife and your kids. Uh, protect you from getting a DUI. And, and protect you from getting a big gut. You know? <laughs> Maybe God's trying to do what's best for you. Keep you off of cops. You know, could it be that God has wisdom in his word for us? And yes, he does. He's worthy of our trust. And as the psalmist affirms, God and his word are worthy of our trust, period. Now look at verse three. It says, for it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. The psalmist uses the imagery of fowlers. That's a word I had to look up. This is a a bird trapper. For his enemies, he's comparing his enemies to those who lay a trap for, for wild animals. His enemies were making attempts against his life. Now, once again, we're not sure who wrote this, Moses, David, maybe somebody else. But I know at least for Moses and for David, this was literally true for them. Moses had Pharaoh breathing down his neck. Uh, there were times when even the Israelites themselves wanted to kill Moses, their leader. And then David... We know he was chased around Israel by the envious, the murderous king Saul. He was dodging spears. He was hiding in caves from hit men. So both of these men knew what it was like to have people try to lay a trap for them. And they know the deliverance of God. And now also notice that the psalmist mentions deadly pestilence. How many times have we talked about this in the last few years? I mean, we're we're still kind of in the the after effects of what happened in in the spring of 2020. Lest we forget, though, God is more powerful than any and all of the dangers of this world, including pandemics. That's clearly in view here. I mean, this was written thousands of years before what we experienced. And, you know, the world has gone through similar things over and over again. But the, the truth of the word is here, that God is mightier than that our God is immortal which means he can redeem us from mortal sickness he's a mysterious God which means he can rescue us from mysterious dangers God is spirit he can protect us from any evil spirit I wanted to share with you a a story I I thought this was pretty interesting I I actually just found this this morning and I thought this story was was great it's about a man named Lord Craven 
He was a wealthy, respected Christian. He lived in London in 1665. Uh, This is when the bubonic plague invaded the city, the Black Plague. The disease spread like wildfire. Thousands were dying each day. The plague was escalating, and the wealthy and influential, they were trying to get out of there. This included doctors, lawyers, clergymen, government officials. They were fleeing the city for protection. Businesses were closing. All trade with London stopped. Meanwhile, those who couldn't afford to leave, they were left to fend for themselves among the sick and the dying in London. And many did die in terrible circumstances. If it wasn't from the plague itself, it was from starvation or even dehydration because of the lack of proper food, shelter, medical care. Now this man, Lord Craven, he was ready to head out himself. He was preparing to leave the perils of London for his home in the country. But at the last moment, something changed his mind. It says this, His lordship, to avoid the danger, resolved to go to his seat in the country. His coach and six were accordingly at the door, his baggage put up, and all things in readiness for the journey. As he was walking through his hall with his hat on, his cane under his arm, and putting on his gloves in order to step into his carriage, he overheard one of his servants saying to another, I suppose by my lord's quitting London to avoid the plague that his God lives in the country and not in town. (laughs) And the speech struck Lord Craven very sensibly and made him pause. My God, thought he, lives everywhere and can preserve me in town as well as in the country. I will even stay where I am. My servant has just now preached to me a very useful sermon. Lord, pardon this unbelief and that distrust of thy providence, which made me think of running from thy hand. He immediately ordered his horses to be taken from the coach and the baggage to be taken in. He continued in London, was remarkably useful among his sick neighbors, and never caught the infection. I thought that was worth sharing. Now, here's a fact that escapes a lot of people's notice. That this world is a deadly place, and nobody gets out of here alive. Have you thought about that? None of us are going to make it out of here alive unless the rapture happens before our death. But remember what Jesus said in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Now there's a difference between comfort and security. Comfort is ease. But security is certainty. In this temporary world, we have to acknowledge that we will always have threats. But we know, those of us who believe, that we're always eternally secure with Jesus. Now now listen to these next verses. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. This is uh, some more poetic imagery about what God is like. And really, these two images, these two metaphors, couldn't be more different. We have a a mama bird covering its babies with its big wings, protecting them, you know, from storms, from predators. And then you also have the imagery of a shield and a a bulwark, a, a strong, impenetrable object of defense, safe in the thickest of the fight. And this is our next point today, that God is both tender and he's tough. He's like the mama bird, but he's also like the shield. He's tender and tough. Tender with his kids, and he's tough for his kids. And all of the good dads in here know what this looks like. You know, this is the character of a godly father. It's rooted in the character of God, our heavenly father. You're tender with your kids, and you're tough for your kids. The same God who struck the Egyptians with plagues spared his children. The same God who drowned the Egyptians in the Red Sea made a safe passage for his children. God is both tender and tough. God is telling us here, he's trying to communicate to us, I've got you, you're mine. I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to take care of those who seek to do you harm. Now verse 5 and 6, fill this out even more. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Our next point is this. Our God never clocks out. 
God never clocks out. For the Hebrew, the day was split into four equal parts, and we see them all in these two verses. What they called night was 6 p.m. to midnight, and then day was 6 a.m. to noon. The time of darkness was midnight to 6 a.m., and then they called noon to 6 p.m. noonday. So we see all of those right here. In other words, God is he's always there. His protection is 24-7, 365. He doesn't take any time off. He doesn't clock out. His protective hand is always there. And God always communicated this to Israel. In Isaiah 43, the beginning of that chapter, list some of the words of the Lord talking about his protective hand over Israel. He said, But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. There's another psalm that talks about how God never sleeps nor slumbers. So God never clocks out. His protection is always there. And the psalmist continues. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side. And 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. At this time, I want to remind us all that there is a coming day of judgment for sinners. Notice, there is a day for recompense for the wicked. Who are the wicked? Those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ and die in their sins. By way of reminder, the Bible does teach that hell is a real place. And also teaches about eternity. And forever is a long time. Now praise God that we who believe we're covered by Jesus' blood. And we're only going to be spectators to the surrounding disaster. When God judges the world. We won't directly experience it because Jesus already took our judgment upon himself at the cross. And that can be true of you today too. If you've not yet bowed the knee to Jesus, do so. Escape the coming judgment, the recompense of the wicked. Now the psalmist continues, verse 9. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. Once again, more imagery of God protecting, even from invisible sicknesses flying through the air. Now, have you ever considered... That God's protection goes beyond what we're even aware of. It's amazing to consider that. You know, looking back through your life, sometimes there's obvious places like, yeah, God saved me from that one. You know, I could have gotten a car accident there. Uh, I could have been in the wrong place, wrong time there. Praise God for his protection. But, but many times he's protecting us and we're not even aware of it. I like the way that the reformer John Calvin talked about this. He said, when we look back on our life, from the perspective of eternity, we're going to see that the power of Satan was so great that the weakness of our flesh was so feeble and that the hostility of the world was so strong that every day of our lives, if God had not intervened, we would have never have made it through a day. We are under his wing. We're under his shield the whole time. Now, God is not obligated to send us some kind of year-end statement about all the times that he's saved our necks. But you can guarantee that he's been doing it. Sometimes we doubt this because we look around, we see bad things do happen. Uh, I personally know a lot of Christians who have died of disease, cancer, accidents. And those instances can cause us to have a crisis of faith. So we do kind of have to explore what, what do we do with that then? Let us not forget what the scriptures talk about that. They're not silent in that regard. God sometimes allows hard times into our lives for our good or for others' good. In other words, there's no pain wasted with God. Romans 8, 28 puts it this way. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. James chapter 1 talks about the benefits in our life of faith when we persevere through trials James the the half brother of the Lord said it this way 
Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Matthew Henry, I I like his comment on here. He says, Though affliction befall thee, yet there shall be no real evil in it, for it shall come from the love of God and shall be sanctified. It shall come not for thy hurt, but for thy good. And though for the present it be not joyous, but grievous, yet in the end it shall yield so well that thou thyself shalt own no evil befell thee. Ultimately, we know this, that God is always right there to strengthen us through it all. Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's look at verse 11 and 12 now. For he will give his angels charge concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Uh, Anybody heard that before? Does that sound familiar to anybody? In Matthew chapter 4, Satan himself misquotes this verse. He takes this verse out of context. He's in the desert. He's trying to tempt Jesus to claim the crown before the cross. You might remember the story. Jesus goes out to the wilderness after his baptism, and it's kind of the inauguration of his ministry. He's out there for 40 days and nights. He, he's fasting, and he's praying, and the enemy goes and tries to tempt him. And one of the temptations was for Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple and have the angels catch him. I always wondered, why is that tempting? <laughs> you know, Unless you're an adrenaline junkie, you know, you like to bungee jump or something. Why is that a temptation? Well, think about what that would do for the people witnessing it. You know, that, the pinnacle of the temple was, I believe, the southeast corner of the temple complex. In other words, this really high prominent area next to the Kidron Valley. Now, if somebody went and did a feat like that and had the angels catch him, everybody watching at the temple, this is the hub of Jewish religion, the, the very center of Jerusalem, the very center of Israel, People watching this, they're going to say, Messiah is here. The king is here. And, and people are going to prematurely identify Jesus as Messiah. What Satan's trying to do is, is to sidetrack Jesus. To take the crown before the cross. Uh, he wants to sidetrack him because if he does so, his mission to save us will fail. But Jesus does not arrogantly or foolishly misapply the scripture. Rather, he trusts his father. He sticks with the program He came first to die on the cross, and so he sets his face like a flint towards Jerusalem and and, and to the cross. Now, one day he will come again to claim his kingdom. That's what the second coming is all about. Now, what's brilliant is that in this passage, Jesus actually uses scripture interpreted rightly to combat scripture interpreted wrongly. Satan takes this, Psalm 91, and twists it, and Jesus fires back at him, with a passage from Deuteronomy, and he says, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Eventually Satan flees. And the angels do come, and they care for Jesus, and that's a neat detail because it shows that they were actually there protecting him all along. Angels are still serving today. They serve us Christians too. Did you know that? Hebrews 1.14 says this, Are they not all ministering spirits? sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So we can claim this passage for us, too. The angels truly are serving us and sent out by God to protect us. And as for Satan, he's a loser. (laughs) If only he kept quoting Psalm 91, it would have been plainly obvious that what follows actually speaks directly against him. Check this out. He stopped too soon. Verse 13, You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Talk about a verse not to take out of context, okay? This is hyperbole. Hyperbole. Uh, God is not encouraging us to deliberately put our lives in danger 
by handling poisonous snakes or messing around with lions or taking tigers by the toe or, you know, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't be foolish. There's actually news stories about pastors who have done this and actually died in the process. It's like, what? Did they not have enough faith? I think they didn't have enough sense. Okay, God, God gives us a brain, we should use it. Okay, don't put yourself in a foolish situation. Now, that being said, the Bible does give us miraculous instances of both of these things happening. Uh, it is true that God has given some believers literal protection on certain occasions. Daniel in the lion's den, Daniel chapter 6, he was rescued from the lion's jaws. And then in Acts 28, Paul the apostle gets bit by a snake on the island of Malta and it does him no harm. But I actually think that the writer's point here is much deeper than something like that. Recall that in the Bible, Satan, our adversary, is compared to both a lion and a snake. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And Revelation 1, 29 uses imagery of the other animal. It says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And this is our next point. Our enemy is defeated. Satan, the roaring lion, that that ancient serpent, he is defeated, trampled down. When did that happen? When Jesus died on the cross. Our Savior Jesus crushed the serpent's head when he died on the cross for our sins. Satan's power was lost. Sure, he might still try to nibble at our heels, but he soon will be bruised under our feet. And God's enemies will not have the ultimate victory. And so we can claim this promise as well. Like the story of Jesus' 70 followers in Luke 10, listen to this. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Now, as the psalm comes to an end, notice in verse 14 through 16, that now it's the Lord directly speaking. It's direct. The Lord himself speaks. Verse 14, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. There's nothing more important than loving God. Notice that in verse 14. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. God rescues the psalmist, not because he deserves it, not because he was sinless, not because he was worthy or he had merit of his own. No, God delivers him because he loves him. The psalmist loves God. Do you remember the most important commandment? Matthew 22, verse 36 and 37. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And God knows if you love him. And he honors that kind of love. Here, there's a promise even of long life which was actually frequently made in the Old Testament to those who were faithful, to those who were wise. A few examples, Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land in which the Lord your God gives you. Then Proverbs 3, verse 1 and 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Once again, how do we reconcile that because I'm sure most of us know people who have gone too soon in our perspective. Good, solid Christian people. How can we explain the fact that when we look around, it seems like God 
has apparently not consistently honored these promises like that of long life. What, what about martyrs, for instance? What about those godly people who have died young? Is, is God unfaithful? Are his promises unreliable? We have to remember Jesus Christ. He himself only walked this earth for 33 years before he hung on a cross. But three days later, he rose from the grave. There was a resurrection for him. We're about to celebrate it this coming week. And there'll be a a resurrection for you too, if you trust in Jesus. This is our last truth today. Life extends beyond the grave. God will ultimately deliver us. Long life? How about eternal life? Life everlasting. God will keep us safe from eternal harm. He offers us a greater eternal security. As one person put it, death just gives us a new address, even closer to God than we are now. Paul put it this way, Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So life extends beyond the grave. Let's not forget that. The Dutch Old Testament scholar Willem van Gemmeren said this, In life... The Lord may permit many terrible things to happen to his children, as he did to his own son, our Lord. But his children know that no power is out of God's control. So nothing can harm you unless the Lord permits it. And I think that should bolster our confidence. Uh, The believer is invincible until his or her time is up. And then we spend eternity with God. We'll be with our Father in heaven. We'll be in our real home, our forever home. All of these promises in Psalm 91 will ultimately be fulfilled. So as we conclude, as we look over the whole psalm, we've seen Yahweh. Who is he? He's a shelter from the storms of life. He's a place of security. He's a refuge to run to for safety in times of danger. He's a fortress that provides us defense against our enemies and against our chief enemy, Satan. That lion, that serpent, who was defeated at the cross. Yahweh is a shelter, a refuge, a fortress. Is he your God? Can you say what the psalmist said? My God in whom I trust. Can you say that? Is he your God? Are you dwelling in the shelter of the Most High? And are you trusting him enough to obey him in your day-to-day life? Because remember, this promise, these assurances are for those who dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I want to give opportunity for those who maybe have not yet made a decision to follow the Lord. Today's the day. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. He did it all for you. Salvation is a free gift given to us by God. We don't pay for a gift. We don't earn a gift. We receive a gift with gratitude, with thanksgiving. And this is what God has provided for us In his son, Jesus, the sinless one, went to that cross to bear our sins. Our sins were placed on him, and he died. He he paid that penalty, that death penalty for sin. And thus, through faith in him, him as our substitute, we can now have a relationship with God. God looks at us and says, your sins are forgiven, you're clean. So would that be true of you today? Follow me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I trust in him. I believe that he went to that cross and I believe that he rose on the third day. I trust him as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for your gift of salvation. I gladly receive it today. Father, we thank you for the comfort of your word. These promises that you are a refuge. You are a fortress. You protect us in so many ways, ways that we don't even realize most of the time. And even if something should befall us in this life, we know that you're going to keep us safe forevermore in heaven. And so, God, we can say no more, but thank you. Thank you for being our God who gives us safety and security. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.